Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Bull Take Scouting Podcast, which is currently being broadcasted live on all the East West Football Network uh, platforms. Me and my uh, coworker, Alex Greb, we are part of the East West uh, Football Network draft team. And today we will be giving you a special podcast episode uh, regarding what we would do with each pick in the top 10 of the 2021 NFL draft if it was just up to us like we were the gen general manager. So feel free to follow along and drop in the comments so we can address them live if you disagree or you, or you agree or what else you would do. And right here we have all our handles on all our different uh, social media platforms if you want to check us out and see all of our draft-related content that we have all over the place. So uh, without further ado, Alex, uh, welcome on. And what would you do with the first overall pick? I mean, the first overall pick is pretty much a gimme. Uh, I think there's really no one uh, in the world that would do anything else other than draft Trevor Lawrence, except today I did see Brett Favre said he would not draft Trevor Lawrence number one overall. Other than Brett Favre, I don't know anyone else who wouldn't take Trevor Lawrence number one of overall for the Jacksonville Jaguars. All due respect to Brett Favre, that, that's probably why he's not still immersed in the, in the football industry but yeah trevor lawrence he's, he's got everything you want he's really tall really athletic great accuracy great intangibles senses pressure well good rush awareness just uh, everywhere you want what he just he checks all the boxes as a as a future franchise quarterback the jaguars have their guy that's who i would pick that's who anybody would pick so really where the draft starts is this second overall pick with the new york jets so just a reminder to everyone, uh, general manager Joe Douglas was retained, but there was a new head coach hired in Robert Sala from San Francisco and a new offensive coordinator, Mike LaFleur. But this is this is what we would do. So, Alex, if you were the general manager of the Jets with a second overall pick and their quarterback situation, what would you do? All right. So if I was Joe Douglas or the general manager of the Jets, I it, it would be a really close call for me, uh, first of all. I have to go quarterback. Um, it's between Justin Fields and Zach Wilson. And it's a really close call because, you know, Wilson fits into that Shanahan scheme uh, a little better than Fields does. But to me, uh, my preference is Fields. I think, yeah, Zach Wilson probably has a little bit higher floor uh, coming out, but I think Fields' ceiling is higher than Wilson's. And I just uh, – Fields is somebody that I really would want – in charge of my team uh, as a leader of my team. So I would go Fields. It's really, really close, though. Uh, what about you? I, I just want to say from the start, I just – there. I hear some people saying, oh, trade back, uh, stick with Sam Darnold, acquire future assets. I cannot find a justification to do that. Like, I just can't. Sam Darnold, for me, is somebody I actually liked coming out. I had a mid-first-round grade on him, but and over three these past three years, he's been in a really bad situation with, with the coaching in New York. But he really hasn't shown anything to merit uh, passing on really talented quarterbacks in Justin Fields and Zach Wilson. I have both of them rated ahead of Darnold coming into the league, and they don't have those three years of disappointment that Darnold has. So for me, it's a no-brainer. you got to go quarterback. And like you, I would lean Justin Fields. I think that he's more battle-tested. And while maybe on tape right now, if you compare the 2020 tape from Fields and Wilson, Wilson might be – more impressive in terms of just consistency with accuracy and decision making and sensing pressure and and fields may have some some issues there especially with with blitz recognition and and trying to force a play sometimes but i think that fields just is more battle tested we have a larger sample size at, at against elite competition and i think he's got all the physical tools and really for me re in recent years we've seen guys like pat mahomes josh allen Justin Herbert come out really with with raw tools, but inconsistencies in their game and, and stuff to clean up. And they've gotten good coaching and have become really top level quarterbacks in this league. And I think Justin Fields actually comes into the league with less of those issues. And I, for me, he's a natural playmaker, and he can he's going to be a franchise quarterback in the next level. If I'm the Jets, that's who I'm picking. Yeah, maybe if we just want to touch on you know why you know i know you said that we don't think sam donald uh, is a future quarterback of the jets regardless of how much more potential we think he has i just think you know he it's done with the jets he's got to move on um from the jets and i think he could succeed elsewhere but i know like you said there's people saying oh trade back keep sam donald there's also people saying keep sam donald and take panay sewell um and 
you know, I wouldn't go that that route either, just because, like you said, number one, um, the the quarterbacks in this draft are, are too good to pass up. And I've heard the argument that, well, okay, yeah, the quarterbacks are great in this draft, but you have so many draft picks. Take Panay Sewell next year if Donald doesn't succeed. Then next year you can go um, take a quarterback in next year's draft. And the reason – you never want to bank on the players in next year's draft. You have no clue who's going to be there. You don't know what position you're going to be in, to, in uh, next year. You don't know if you're going to have to trade up next year. And might as well utilize all these picks that you have um, to take as many quality players as possible to help improve that roster because – the Jets roster is not very good. So I just think these quarterbacks um, between Fields and, Fields and Wilson, they are very, very good quarterbacks. I would say they'd be quarterback ones in most other years. Um, so you you just cannot pass that up. No matter how how many draft picks you have as ammunition to trade up for the next years, you, just, you can't bake on any of that. You know Fields and Wilson are here. You know they'll be available at your pick you know that they'd probably be the quarterback one next year if either of them um, was in the draft next year instead. So you take it, you say, you get what you can get for Sam Donald, and you move on and start over on that offense. I totally agree. I, th- I, I think that argument is really flawed. As you said, right now, you're picking second overall. You have a choice of Justin Fields and Zach Wilson. You can't pass that up. So now moving to – the third overall pick. If you were the Miami Dolphins, what would you be doing here? Well, first of all, if I was the Miami Dolphins right now, I would be constantly on the phone with Houston trying to trying to make a trade for Deshaun Watson. But that hasn't happened. We don't have any idea if that's going to happen. Um, and we're going with what the draft order is today at the end of January. So if I were the Dolphins – You know, it might be a little tempting to take – now Fields is off the board. It might be a little tempting to take Wilson here. But uh, you got to give Tua another shot, I think. You know, he didn't didn't show anything to show that he was a star last year, but there wasn't a lot to show me that he's not the franchise quarterback of the future. I think he had a year that you would expect from a rookie quarterback making a transition from a high-talent college like Alabama. So – if I'm with Miami Dolphins, I would um, – and staying in the pick, I would take Panay Sewell. Now, I'm going to disagree with you, and if I were the Miami Dolphins, I would be picking a quarterback at number three overall. And let me tell you, this is not even a knock on, on Tua. I, I just think that the way I graded Tua last year, and for me I had – a early second round pick. And that was mostly because he had a lot of injury issues coming out. And so I, I gave, I bumped the grade down for medical reasons, but even without that, the grade would not have been as high as the grades I have on fields and on Wilson. And I, I really, I actually do not like people just slandering Tua right now for his rookie year, because he was re- he really didn't have many weapons and he played smart. He was conservative. He didn't turn the ball over much, but at, at the end of the day, for me, I know that I think of, Fields and Wilson higher, highly than more higher than I did of of Tua last year. So for me, I'm on the phone trying to call all these teams and seeing, hey, hey, do you want Tua? What like I I I know all the information that I had last year, so I know which which teams will like Tua. And there's several teams in the back half of the first round that are really in that no man's land in this draft, but don't have a future plan at quarterback that could be interested. If you could net a late first or maybe a second round pick for, for Tua and take someone that I actually had rated higher than Tua coming out with either Fields or Wilson, because one of them is guaranteed to be available at third overall. That's what I'm doing. I, and that's just, I, it's unpopular. And by no means am I saying that Tua cannot be a franchise quarterback. I think he, he with, with the right development and with the right supporting cast, he, he can be, I just think higher of the two other quarterbacks and I'm sitting here at third overall and I'm looking, well, I prefer these quarterbacks. So that's the pick I would make. Yeah, that you know, that's that's a really great point. I just to me, I, I still think Tua has has the potential to be a franchise quarterback. So if if I have a quarterback and I say, you know what, I believe this guy has a potential to be a franchise quarterback, I would do everything I can to support him and help him reach the level that I believe he can. You know, going back to the Jets pick for a second, as the GM of the Jets. 
I think Donald still has the potential, but not with the Jets. I think in order for him to become a franchise quarterback, he'd have to go elsewhere, and that's why I'm moving on from Donald. Back to Miami for a second. I think Tua has a chance to be a franchise quarterback with Miami, so I'm going to do everything I can to help improve his situation, improve his offensive line. And I know, you know, people say, you know, they could go wide receiver here. Um, I understand that. I just think there's too, the depth of wide receiver um, is too too good on this draft to take the third overall pick um, and use it on a wide receiver when you have somebody like Panay Sewell uh, available. But I definitely see what you're saying. And I think both of us would agree that the number one thing we would, do, we would be doing is trying to trade this pick uh, for Deshaun Watson. Can, can you agree with me on that one? Uh, it depends on the asking price. I, I love Deshaun Watson. I think he's an elite quarterback. But I've heard some things saying that it's three firsts, three seconds, and a pro ball level quarter, a player, not, not quarterback, player. Um, and so I, it just, I would definitely be working the phones and doing everything I can. It's just I can't mortgage the entire future of the franchise based on that. I, although if, if it's a reasonable price, oh, yeah, immediately. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, especially someone in Miami's uh, situation right now, they have a really good roster. They're probably a few a few pieces away, I would say, from being a contender. Um, so you can't you can't sell the farm. You can't mortgage the future uh, to get Sean Watson. I think, you know, I'd be calling, trying to get it down. You could you can make an argument that this third overall pick in this draft is worth three firsts on its own. So you could make the argument to Houston. You could say, look, this pick is worth three firsts by itself. We'll give you another first, maybe two seconds. Watson doesn't want to be there. Let's make the trade. But, you know, if we have to stick in this spot, I said I'm picking Panay Sewell. You said you're picking Zach Wilson. Uh, I think we can move on to Atlanta now. So, Casa, what would you do uh, if you were Atlanta? Well, it seems like I'm saying the same thing for the third time. But if, if Justin Fields or Zach Wilson is available, that's who I'm picking. Again, I just think so highly of these two quarterbacks as future franchise quarterbacks. And for me, when I evaluate the state of the Falcons roster – I don't think there's enough talent surrounding Matt Ryan and Julio Jones in order to make a serious Super Bowl push in in this closing window that is their careers. And uh, as harsh as it is, because I think Matt Ryan has been a really solid quarterback for a long time in uh, Atlanta, I think it would be time to to draft his successor because the Falcons are really not a team that that usually pick this high. And I you really it, they're sitting here at fourth overall. And in a draft class where the top quarterbacks are just so good compared to any other year, we have three really good ones and a fourth that we'll discuss maybe a little later, who's also very talented. But for me, I, I, I really have to to pick one of those quarterbacks and groom him behind uh, Matt Ryan because I just don't think they're a contender, regardless of what they do in the next couple of years at the end of Ryan's career. And if both quarterbacks somehow go two and three after after Trevor Lawrence, I'm picking. I'm going best player available, Panay Sewell. And I'd be very happy with that if that were to happen, if I, if I miss out on the top two quarterbacks or top three. Yeah, so I'm going to agree with you here. Uh, and I'm going to agree with everything you said about Matt Ryan. He's still really good, but they, they don't have the pieces to be a contender within the next two, three years. And the problem with that is Matt Ryan probably has – he probably has four or five more near elite level uh, quarterback years left. Um, and you know, I, as hard as it is, uh, for Falcons fans to take in, I, I really think that, you know, you're going to, I would take, who do I have left? Zach Wilson left, you know, Wilson or Fields is there. Um, but you know, I, I think they just have to take Wilson and, and probably move on, um, from Matt Ryan, which is, you know, unfortunate, but it's, it's probably the best for both of them, right? You know, the Falcons, they're in a weird stage and not a complete rebuild, but not ready to contend within the next few years. You know, maybe three years down the line, they'll be ready to go with a new young quarterback. Um, and, you know, it's it's fair to Matt Ryan to say, look, we love what you've done here. We appreciate everything you've done, but we don't think we're going to be contenders within the next three, four years. We want you to go somewhere where you can be the most successful. Um, and, we have a, a comment that says here, I'll just uh, put it up on the screen. It says, if I'm the Falcons, I'm trading down. They need to improve their defense. Um, and I, I can see that rationale. Um, but I, I just think that the quarterbacks are too good um, for the Falcons to pass up. And, 
like you said, they're probably not going to be in this position again. Their roster, let, let's be honest, their roster is too good for them to have the fourth overall pick. It was a really weird year for the Falcons. They're not going to be this bad um, again. So you strike when the iron's hot. You take the quarterback, move on from Matt Ryan, probably move on from Julio Jones, acquire more assets that you can take some defensive players with this year and next year uh, possibly. You know, it's not a one-year thing, I think. They need to be looking two, three, four years down the road to say, look, we can be a contender in two, three, four years. If we get the right quarterback, we get the right pieces, we start over with a young team. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. And now to move on to the fifth overall pick, the Cincinnati Bengals. For me, you've got the, for the first team in the top five that really clearly has their quarterback of the future. I think so highly of Joe Burrow. I think he's a future pro ball player and even dare I say a Super Bowl winner because he's just he's got that winning intangible but so the the premier thing for me is they need pro- protection for him I think they really really need Panay Sewell Panay Sewell is just such a good left tackle prospect he's got all the athleticism physicality strength mobility in the world uh, just amazing physical traits and for me I think that the, the what they're hoping is that Third overall, maybe the Dolphins go wide receiver. Fourth overall, maybe the um, the Falcons take the uh, another uh, quarterback, and then Panay Sewell sitting right there. That's what I would be hoping to happen. And if Sewell isn't there, I want to trade down. I I want to trade down, and I want to target either Rayshon Slater or Christian Darrisaw. I think they're both really good tackle prospects, and they'd be solid blindside protectors for the next ten years. Fifth overall is just a little too rich for me, and I think one of them will be available if they were to drop back into that 8 to 12 range. And so if they can drop back, acquire future assets, um, I think that that's the best route, especially if somehow one of the quarterbacks were, was – one of the top three quarterbacks was still available at fifth overall pick, they could get a lot of value there. So for me, I want an offensive tackle, Panay Sewell if he's there. If not, trade down for Slater or Darisaw. Yeah, so I, I – um... I agree with you. Uh, I I would hope that Sewell is going to be there, but I highly, highly doubt it. Um, so I agree. You know, I think they should really be targeting, like you said, Slater or Darius. Uh, I agree with you. I think they're great uh, tackle prospects, but they don't need to take them at five. If you look, you have Philly and Detroit, two teams that could go a wide receiver. And, you know, maybe there's another wide receiver needy team that says, you know what, I want to jump Detroit and Philly, or maybe even if, Detroit and Philly want the same guy and they know or Cincinnati can convince uh, Detroit that Philly wants the wide receiver that they want. They could, you know, get a few, you know, maybe a, a third, third round pick. I don't know what the, what the price would be to jump up two spots for Detroit, but any draft picks that they can get and still end up getting the same player is a win. Um, so yes, I agree. If I'm the Bengals, I'm looking to trade down and um I'm targeting Slater and Darisaw, like you said. I would, if I if I had no offers uh, on the table, um, I would take Slater. But I'm looking to trade down, and I'm saying I'll take either one of those guys. You need to protect Joe, Bur- Joe Burrow. Yeah. So now moving on to uh, the Philadelphia Eagles at number six. Um, they're they're really a heavily linked team to taking a wide receiver, maybe Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase. What would you do if you were the Eagles at number six? So if I were the Eagles at six, I would take mm, pro- probably Jamar Chase. Um, I think he's probably the best. My board's not uh, fully set yet, but he's probably the best player um, left on the board. And I know it would be hard for the Eagles to do this, I think, because they just took Jalen Rager uh, at sixth overall. But if I were the GM, I'd say – if I'm the GM, I wouldn't have picked Rager last year. I would have picked Justin Jefferson, and then we wouldn't be in this position. But Rager was picked last year. If I'm the GM, I said, look, you know, Rager could be good, but he was a miss. You know, he's he's not a first-round player. Um, so I would take Jamar Chase. you you, you got to upgrade that wide receiver core. It's, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, so, yeah, Chase, Chase is six for the Eagles. Yeah, so now I'm going to have another unpopular pick, but I I would not be picking a wide receiver sixth overall if I was the Philadelphia Eagles. And that might be really surprising, but I just I think that there's better value at other positions and wide receiver is the sort of posi- position where you can find talent either in free agency 
or maybe in the second round. For me, I'm thinking this free agent class, I'm looking at Allen Robinson or Kenny Galladay, and I'm thinking those are two really reliable move the chains targets at wide receiver and and a rookie w- would be nice but i think they they've I, for the, for me with the eagles they just really need a veteran receiver that that can consistently move the chains for them and and bring that all that experience and that's really what they're missing in the wide receiver room and as you said i definitely would have picked jefferson over rieger but rieger's there and i think rieger does have potential he he came out he came out pretty broad but he does have good explosive athleticism and you you have to count on him to take that next step so for me i would be looking at free agency to target one of the one of these top free agents pair them with rieger and then Maybe in the second round, I, I'm looking for a Rashad Bateman. I really like Bateman. I think that he's a good he's big body and great route runner to get separation dis, uh, despite that size. And, uh, and so back to sixth overall, what I would be doing it, now that I've addressed the wide receiver position, either in free agency or in the second round or both, is at sixth overall, I'm I'm going either Rashawn Slater or Quiddy Pay. They might both be available. Um in that situation, I think I'd probably take Quiddy Pay because I just think he's he's such he's such a such an elite edge prospect. He he's got a really thick, compact build, really good athleticism, and he showed a, a, a great level of refinement to his game in 2020. And so I think just having that disruptive presence off the off the edge on a rookie contract the next five years, if they if you combine that with signing a veteran uh, wide receiver and maybe drafting Bateman in the second round, that I think that's the recipe for success and putting Carson Wentz back on track in Philadelphia. That's what I would do if I was the general manager of the Eagles. Yeah, I I definitely um, would address a wide receiver in free agency, but why not get two of those guys? I mean, Carson Wentz clearly needs some help. I'm assuming that they still want him to be the quarterback of the future, uh, judging by their head coaching hire. So why not go with two of those guys? Why not, you know, maybe take Kenny Galladay and Jamar Chase. Or Allen Robinson, Jamar Chase, um, or, or I don't know off the top of my head any other free agent wide receivers, but I know this is a really, really solid uh, free agency class. And you know, obviously, we're doing this before free agency, so um, obviously after free agency, some of these picks would be different, you know. But I just I think Chase is with the Eagles at six. I think that's probably their biggest need. And he's probably the best player on the board. So I, I just it's hard for me to pass up on my biggest need and my best player on the board, um, even if there are other better wide receivers uh, to be taken in the second and third round. Yeah, I think I think where we differentiate a little bit is I don't the way my board is gonna is gonna look like I'm going to have uh, Pay and, and and Slater over the the, the two wide receivers. I really like Smith and Chase, but I just have a question mark on both of them. For Smith, I love everything I see on tape. But can he survive in the NFL with the, with the with the frame he has? Could take consistently taking way more hits and way harder hits than he took in college. And with Chase, I just think that when he's facing up against the athletic corner, which he will very often in the NFL, he's not he's not an elite separator, and that's why I, I really and and he has really concerning lack of effort in the run game, and so that's why with both those question marks, sixth overall, I really can't do it. And considering the options in free agency and the potential of uh, maybe trading off to the top of the second or back in the first for Bateman. I I don't, I don't see the value there. I'd rather take pay or Slater. They're much safer picks in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think, I think, I do think that uh, Slater would be a really good pick for them, especially with, you know, they're, they're set uh, right tackle with Lane Johnson for, I don't know, probably the next four or five years, I think, but at at left tackle they're they're struggling. Uh, So I, I do think Slater would be a really good pick. Um, and I think that would that would be a good a good debate to have uh, in the draft room with you know Slater's Slater's available, you know let's take him. So uh, now I think we can move on to Detroit uh, number seven. So what would you do if you're the uh, the GM for Detroit? So now this is this is, it's kind of weird on how to approach this because if we're the because right now there is news that's already broken that Matt Stafford will not be returning. To, to the team and they're going to mutually part ways. And if I was general manager, I really would have wanted to, to keep Stafford because I, th- I really, I think highly of Stafford. And I think he's just never had the coaching and the, and the, and the team around him to make a, a serious playoff push. But I also the part of the reports are that it's not the Lions getting rid of Stafford. Stafford also wants a fresh start. So I'm going to say, okay, 
that that we're going to move away from from Matt from Matt Stafford. And I got to do everything I can to get Fields or Wilson. Um, and if that means a trade up, then then that's what I'll do. I'm going to gather all my information that I have come April on how the board's going to shake out on if, if where I need to move up, if I need to move up. Um, and I want to do everything I can to get either Wilson or Fields because I think it's time for it, it looks like it's time for a fresh start in Detroit. Again, I've, I'm going to reiter- reiterate that they're both future franchise quarterbacks in my mind, and you really need to get one of them. And so uh, they might have to move up a little bit from number seven or a vault to do that. Yeah, I agree. The The number one team uh, that I would be targeting to trade up with is probably the Dolphins at three. I would try to do whatever I could. Um, to say, look, Miami, you, you have your quarterback. Uh, it's who we we need to move up. Um, and, you know, I'd be willing to give up a good amount um, of draft capital to move up from seven to three. And, and you know, there's argument that you know maybe you could take uh, Lance here, but this is not a good spot for Lance. I think the quarter if they draft the quarterback, that quarterback's going to have to start day one. I don't even know what other quarterbacks they have on the roster besides Matthew Stafford. Chase Daniel. Yeah, yeah Chase Daniels, exactly. Um, so he's not really – he's not the guy you want to put out there to start your season. The fans will be calling for for Lance. And Lance needs at least a year, um, in my opinion, to sit and learn the game and develop and get used to the speed and the defenses and everything just because of the level of competition he played at, which, you know, I don't want to knock him for. He played where he played. He can't really do too much about that, but – and he only played a season, so he's going to need to sit, learn, develop. And if I'm the GM in Detroit, I'm saying, look, even if I – you know, I think he has potential, I think his potential will be ruined if he has to start day one. And if – you know, in Detroit, that's probably what's going to have to happen. So I'm doing everything I can to move up to three with the Dolphins. I agree. I think that it's not the right place for Lance because you you need a quarterback there who you can play that full first year while you develop Lance, um, and that that you won't have the pressure from the organization and from the fans to put Lance in prematurely and and really stunt his development. But that, that transitions us into the eighth overall pick, the Carolina Panthers. And if I was the general manager of the Carolina Panthers, I would be selecting Trey Lance. It's a little higher than where my grade is going to end up, but this is where the situation makes me really comfortable with this pick. Teddy Bridgewater is the type of quarterback that you, I don't think you can win a Super Bowl with. He's just not dynamic enough, but he will certainly play well enough for a full year for to, to be able to – have confidence in, in the team during that year to, to not fall apart and you won't be having all that pressure to put in Lance because as you said, Lance is, is he's first of all, he's a really athletic dynamic thrower and runner, great dual threat. Um, and, and he really limits his turnovers too, which is, which is crucial for a developmental prospect to be able to maybe have those growing pains when he eventually hits, hits the field, but he doesn't, he's not a turnover machine, so he's not going to get pulled. They're, you're going to allow him to play and grow. And for me, that that's what Trey Lance is going to do. And he really has such high upside. He can almost not revolutionize because we've seen guys like Lamar Jackson, uh, Kyler Murray, but he could be the next in that mold. And I think he has the potential to be, might I say, a better thrower than both of them. He's just a one-year starter from the FCS with inconsistent footwork. So that's why he needs his full year to develop. You've got Teddy Bridgewater. You, you, you've got job security if you're Matt Rule. So if I'm the general manager, I'm going ahead. I'm trusting the development uh, and, and the coaching. I'm drafting Trey Lance if I'm the Panthers. Oh, yeah, totally. I agree. I think, you know, if you looked at all 32 teams uh, in the NFL and look at them in draft order, this is one of the best two or three situations. I'd say the best. For Trey Lance to go. I think uh, you can make the argument that San Francisco would be better a better – uh, fit. You could, yeah. You have Jimmy Garoppolo. You can you can say, look, we're not getting rid of you. You're you're stuck here this year. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're we're not talking about the 49ers. We're talking about the Panthers. And I think behind San Francisco, this is the best place for Trey Lance to go. Like you said, Teddy Bridgewater. He's not a quarterback you can win a Super Bowl with. He's a quarterback that can start for a year. You saw it. They started him this year, and they went five and eleven, which was a little underwhelming. I would expect them to be better. Uh, with Teddy Bridgewater this year, maybe, you know, in the 6 and 10, 9 and 7 range. But even if they don't have a good record, he's a guy that he can keep as a starter all year. He's a guy that I don't really think the fans will revolt, revolt against too much. 
you know, um, if you're in Detroit, like we said, Detroit's Chase Daniels, the fans would go after them. But everybody likes Teddy Bridgewater. I think he could let him sit for the year. Um, and, you know, if I'm the GM, I, I'd take Trey Lance and I'd say to Matt Rule, we're not starting him this year at all. Go ahead, stay it in press conference. He needs at least a year to develop. Teddy Bridgewater is our quarterback for at least the next 16 games. And, hey, if, if we go 5-11 again with Teddy Bridgewater, that's fine with me because that just puts us in a better spot next year to pick a better player to probably help out Trey Lance on the offense. Yeah, that, that, I, I just love the whole plan. It, the situation it just screams the perfect fit for Trey Lance. So now I'm going to move on to, to the ninth overall pick with the, with the Denver Broncos. And I'm going to ask – why is this not a team rumored to go get one of these top four quarterbacks and specifically the top three? Because I think they're in Detroit situation where there is no bridge quarterback on that roster. Um, and so if I, I'm seeing a lot of defensive players mocked to, to the Broncos and there are impact defensive players that that would be good additions for them. But Drew Locke is not a franchise quarterback. I'm 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 sorry to, to break it to whoever still has a glimmer of hope for him. But I just I don't think you'll ever get out of him that that risky play style that gunslinger mentality that results in too many turnovers and too many missed shots and uh, for me i i'm seeing the top the talent at the top of the quarterback class and i'm working the phone and doing everything i can to get either fields or wilson because for me that the broncos just that they they need that they need to get that franchise quarterback because i don't think he's on the roster if by if if they really if no one wants to trade with them, which is obviously it's a, it's a real possibility, and they have to stay put and, and miss out on those top quarterbacks, I would be. Uh, I, which defensive which player would I go? I probably I probably I'd, I'd hope Quiddy Pay is there. If, if if Pay is there, then then he's he's the guy I'm picking because I'm thinking Von Miller is getting kind of old. Uh, but if, so if you can have Pay and Bradley Chubb for years to come, coming off the edge. Oh boy. Oh boy. I think that's great. And with a couple of years of Von Miller left. So that could instantly make the defense really good. Otherwise I'd be looking, um, I'd be looking maybe even the offensive line with Slater or Darisaw or maybe a corner like Patrick Sertan or Caleb Farley, but I'm, I'm doing everything I can to trade up for a quarterback. One of the, either Wilson or Fields. Yeah, I agree. No one's really mentioned it. I think everyone just kind of assumes that Drew Locke is getting another year. And like you said, I, I don't think he's a franchise quarterback. I don't think he's really showed, uh, shown very much at all that he has a chance to be a franchise quarterback. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I don't really like saying that about guys because, you know, it's this is their livelihood, but it is what it is. You know, he's not a franchise quarterback. Um, but I just – I think Denver's in a really weird spot to try to move up because I think you're going to have – Teams probably like Detroit trying to get up in the top three. You, Carolina could try to jump up into the top three too. Um, I think, you know, Atlanta is going to want to probably try to get at one of the quarterbacks. Um, so you really have to move up to three. And if I'm Miami, I don't want to move down to nine. I, I think probably – there's a possibility the top three offensive tackles could be gone by pick nine. So if I'm Miami, that's that's what I want to target. Um, and I don't I don't want to move past number seven. Um, so I just think it's going to be really hard for Denver to move up for a top quarterback. So assuming that none of the three are available, I don't think Lance would fit here in Denver. Um, I I would have to go Quiddy Pay. Um, there's a possibility he's gone, so he, I'm crossing my fingers um, and hoping that he falls to nine. If he doesn't, um, I would probably go Patrick Sertan. Um, I, I think that their secondary is, you know, it's not what it was a few years ago. I think Sertan can be a great great addition to that secondary. And, and Denver's just like a defense-first mentality team, and I think they really thrive from having a really good defense, especially at home. Um, playing up a mile high where, you know, the air center, some of the offenses struggle a little bit. So if you have a defense, one with Quiddy play that can get after it and get after the quarterback and rush the pass, or I think that'd be huge. But I also think Patrick Sertain having a really good corner uh, would just help the pass rush. So I think either way, I'd either go Quiddy pay if he's there or Patrick Sertain if uh, pay has gone. 
Yeah, and I just wanted to to mention that we have we've got some some comments on the side. So I think right after this next pick, we can we can pop those one by one and answer answer people's questions and react to their comments. And once we we finish the the discussion, so real quick, tenth overall, um, we've got the Dallas Cowboys picking, and for me. Uh, I think this is this is really similar because I think they they really need to go best player available on offensive line or defense. They they've got for me I'm bringing back Prescott. I, I think a lot of people are agreeing with that. Zeke can definitely uh, get back to to prior level or at least close to it. Um, and and they've they've got a really nice trio of receivers. So for me it's offensive line or defense. Quidi Pay if he's there or Rayshon Slater or Christian Derrissaw. Or Sertan, like it's, I think that you can't go wrong with any, any of those picks. So that's that's what I would do for the for the Cowboys. Yeah, I agree. Once you get down to you know pick ten, pick eleven, uh, we're not going to be discussing that. But once you get down there and you're doing a, what would you do if you were the GM? There's not really one pick that I can say I would go because there's a possibility of some of these guys being gone. So we kind of have to throw out a few names that we say, all right. We'll have him in this order, um, and we'd take this guy if he's available. If not, we'll go to the next guy. So I think <laughs> number one, if Quiddy is there, I'm taking him. Um, and then two, probably Patrick Sertan. Um, I'm assuming Slater's going to be gone. And well, we can't be sure of that. Okay, so so let's say Slater's not gone. So Slater would probably be one, um, and then pay. And then it, actually, that's that's a toss up. Um, I don't think my board's set. Uh, so either one of those two, I don't think you can really go wrong with that. Um, and if both of those guys are gone, I'd go Sertan and Derisaw. And I think any one of those four guys, I think, will be an instant upgrade um, for the Dallas Cowboys. And I think they can't go wrong with either of those four picks. But, you know, there's really no GM in Dallas. Jerry Jones runs the show. <laughs> So who knows what's going to go on uh, with Dallas at number 10. So um, like you said, I think we have a few, a few questions and I, I wanted to hold off on them till the end because I don't really want to mess up the flow of, you know, with the picks one through 10. So um, I think we can do answer some of the questions now. So the first question, I'll just put it up. Um, who do you think Green Bay should pick? So Green Bay had a tough end to their season. Um, yesterday, and if I'm Green Bay at 29, now it's it's really hard to go one guy, but I'm honestly I'm looking to probably go wide receiver. I'm going to cross my fingers and hope Bateman's there. I think he could be a great addition to that offense. Um, but I, I also think you could maybe target an offensive lineman here. Um, I think what what you gave me that face. They got they've got a great offensive line. They, I I think I think they they they, they it's wide receiver or or if, if anything else maybe maybe it may be a corner because we saw Kevin King got get burnt a lot. I just I think the offensive line is the strength of the team along with Aaron Rodgers. Well, the, the problem is Corey Lindsay is a free agent, um, and he might leave. It's a really talented O line class. You can get one later. I think that sitting there at thirty one, it's your your or twenty nine. My guy's not in the Super Bowl. <laughs> but I, uh, for me, I, I'm hoping Bateman's there. If not, I'm I'm doing a lot of research on Kadarius Tony, and I'm I'm because I've heard there's some character issues on him. Those need to check out, and I need to be confident that he can really put in the work to develop and become a complete receiver. But just thinking of having Devonte Adams as that really reliable move the chains receiver, and then an explosive field stretcher uh, who 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 should evolve into a more complete receiver than uh, and more reliable than Marquez Valdez Scantling? That would really be a big plus for the Packers. So that that's what I would be looking at. Yeah, yeah I would, I agree. Uh, I think wide receiver is the number one uh, priority here. But at twenty nine, who knows who's going to be there? Um, I think probably the top the top three corners are going to be gone. Um, Horn might be available, probably, probably not. It's probably still a toss up right now. So you know they probably could go Horn, but but I'm just I'm just thinking if if Corey Lindsay leaves in free agency, a guy that I would target. I know it's kind of a toss up uh, with some people, but I would target Creed Humphrey there if Corey Lindsay leaves in free agency. If not, then obviously you don't need a replacement for him, and you cross your fingers uh, and hope that you get a wide receiver. But they should have done that last year, and they should have done that the year before. <laughs> Yeah. So if you want to pop up the next question, we can we can move on. I think now. Yeah. So 
we have a it's more of a comment um it says so i'm assuming i'll, you know, I'll address this one because because i was the one who made the comment i do yeah. think joe burrow is going to win a super bowl one day it won't be anytime soon because the Bengals are just so far from it but we saw what burrow did at lsu granted he had a lot of talent but they were people were saying that in february of the year before everyone around the lsu organization believed that they were they were going to win a national title. They were going to put all the work into it, but that it was going to happen. And that was all Joe Burrow. He came into that program, galvanized everyone, and just instilled so much belief in them. I think he, he's just, he's he, his intangibles and his and his personality are just, he, he, he's a winner. And for me, I think that they're, they're going to trend in the right direction. And at some point down the line, I see Joe Burrow winning a Super Bowl. Yeah, I really love uh, Joe Burrow's attitude um, about everything. And I think my favorite Joe Burrow moment is the interview he had um, with a reporter before the national championship game. Not right before, but it was a few days before, after he won the Heisman. And the reporter holds up a picture of Joe Burrow. He's probably, I don't know, eight years old. And um, the reporter says, do you, do you think this looks like a Heisman Trophy winner? And Joe Burrow looks at her and he says, damn right he does. And she goes, what would, you do? what would you say to this kid now? And he goes, looks like a national champion too. And that is probably my favorite Joe Burrow moment ever, and that probably will be. Um, and I, just that attitude that he has is just infectious. Um, and he's going to be a guy, you know, maybe the team around him isn't necessarily a Super Bowl favorite quality, but he just has that, just that charisma and just that drive. And the ability to get everyone around him motivated and believing that they're going to win a Super Bowl. So I agree. I, I, I think Joe Burrow will win a Super Bowl uh, before his before his career ends. So I think um, the last question that we have is, where do we see Kyle Trask going? And I, do you want to address this one first? Or this, this is such a difficult question to answer. I think Kyle Trask's range is, is so wide. But at this point in the process, I, I don't think he's going to be a first rounder. I think it, I, I just don't think a team's going to want to bank on on him being a first rounder. He doesn't have the physical traits to be a first rounder, and he doesn't have the mental flawlessness that, say, Joe Burrow has to make up for a, a lack of top level physical traits in order to be a first round. He's just, yeah, not, not round one mental game and not round one uh, physical traits for me. And then that, that he get, that's where you get into that, that weird zone of not many quarterbacks go in the second round, because if you like the guy that much, you take, usually take him in the first. So, um, and he, he's not really that like Jalen hurts type skill set um, to go in that range. I, I could see a draft day fall for Kyle Trask. I could see him slipping like a, say Mason Rudolph did um, to, in like the mid round three area. I, I wouldn't be shocked. I just think that he he's not going to be projected as a franchise quarterback. And that means that if that, if that's the case, then he's he, nobody's going to want to take him before then. So whether or not the, the media catches on to that um, by, by the draft, I think it could happen that he could, he could end up sliding that far, but really his, his range is, is quite, quite wide. Yeah, I agree. I think, I, I, I agree with you with uh, my evaluation of him. I have him as a, a, a third round, a third round grade on him. And I, I, I just don't see it. I think he, his draft value is probably blown up by the media. Like you said, um, more than, you know, what the teams actually think about him, but all it takes is for one team to fall in love with him and take him at the end of the first round. So I'm going to say that his, Range is probably 32. Um, and no, the Chiefs will not be picking Kyle Trask. But it's, you know, it's the, what happened with Lamar Jackson a few years ago where a team trades up to 32, uh, a team that falls in love with Kyle Trask and says, we want that five year, the fifth year option. So we're going to take him at 32. Um, if I was GM of any of these 32 teams, I would not take Kyle Trask. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, where do we see him going? I think there's a possibility he goes at 32. If he doesn't go in the first round, like you said, I do not see him going in day two. I mean, in round two, I see him going probably, you know, maybe late, mid to late third round. So I think it's not as much as a range as it's a jump, right? If a team falls in love with him, they'll take him at the end of round one. If not, he's – 
I highly, highly doubt he's going to go round two. So it's it's the end of round one or round three uh, for me. It's possible that he goes in round two, but it's just, again, if a team likes him that much, it would probably be in the first round. And so I think that just, just about wraps it up on, on what we would be doing if we were the general manager of these top 10 teams. And remember, if you like the content, make sure to subscribe and watch on, on YouTube, or you can listen on Spotify or Apple podcasts. And we've also on our Instagram page, which is probably our main platform. We've got so much draft related content turning up out about three to four posts a week, two scouting reports a week, and feel free to DM us and tell us who you want to see up there. And uh, we've got mock drafts, bold takes. We're going to have scout versus scout uh, analysis. Um, and right now we have a senior bowl preview up and we'll definitely, our next po- podcast episode next week will be uh, a senior bowl review. And so we're, we're excited to, for you to join us then. Yeah. Like Costa said, be sure to check us out. Bold takes scouting on Instagram, YouTube, uh, Apple and Spotify. And then bold takes out on Twitter. And then of course, be sure to check out the East West Football Network um, on their website and all their plat- uh, platforms, Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter again. So thanks to everyone who tuned in. Thanks to everyone who's going to be listening on the podcast. Um, and have a good night, everybody.